Good day and welcome to this interview. My name is Megan Sylvester and I am the Education and Research Officer at the Board of TUCO. And we are doing this project entitled Calypso, the New York Experience, jointly with WAC. And we are doing this project in particular because we're very interested in the experience of Calypsonians, songwriters, arrangers, producers, and anyone who was involved in the Calypso fraternity in Trinidad and Tobago who would have migrated to New York. And for today's interview, we're speaking to Andrea Jenny Phillips, well known for having written Pan by Storm and Pan Ecstasy. So we now invite Andrea to tell us a little bit about who is Andrea Jenny Phillips. Hi, good evening, and thank you for inviting me on the platform. Um, I am Andrea Jenny Phillip, and yes, I did pen Pan Ecstasy and Pan by Storm. I am currently retired and seizing the opportunity to tap into my family and my culture. So I'm very happy to be on this platform, maybe to express myself as I move along. Mm -hmm. And so tell us a little bit about how you became involved in Calypso, how you became involved in writing for Calypso, you know, because many of the young people who would really be interested in this video and in this interview would want to know what is going on behind the scenes of a songwriter for Calypso. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay, it didn't really start as writing songs. I've always liked writing. I was an English major, English honor student, but always liked writing. And um, I seized the opportunity once I got involved with my culture to write music or write songs, write lyrics for songs, different songs. I've did, done odes, I've done little poems, I've, you know, before, but um, this is just the icing on the cake, Pan writing the lyrics to Pan by Storm and Pan Ecstasy. And um, it's just a love, you know, because sometimes as a writer, you, you know, you get writer's block, but it just, it's just a God-given gift. And tell us a little bit about how you would have even been in the space to have the opportunity to write these two songs. Because it's so important, as I speak to young people, when I go to do uh, presentations at secondary schools, the young people always ask me about all the various um, jobs and occupations that are in or within the collective kind of fraternity. And the, some people don't want to be on the stage. They don't want to sing, but they want to perhaps write or they want to perhaps be, belong to some other aspect of the fraternity. So what actually got you into writing this particular these two songs and in terms of calypso okay i left home trinidad at an early age you know during my secondary school years and i came to the united states not being involved with my my culture my you know at all of going to school or my upbringing i was kind of sheltered and you know at that time, having to be uh, involved in pan and mass and stuff was they were stereotyping that, and you know my parents would not have allowed me in in no way, but um, to get involved. But as I got older, um, I, I I was curious. I was curious because I re I really like calypso and dancing and you know so. In 1983, I met Ken, Professor Fillmore, and um, he just, it was a connection there. You know, he just exposed me to Calypso, Pan, and everything. And I, I just fell in love, um, Miss Sylvester. I fell in love with it all. So I, decide, I decided, you know, I am going to stick with this. So, like I told the students of um, saying the St. Augustine Senior Comprehensive uh, on one of my visits to Trinidad, um, they played Pan by Storm, as a matter of fact, in the, the, for their school year. And I um, sat with them at the ex, ex, Exodus, ex, Exodus's um, Pan Yard. And um, they asked a couple of questions, and I told them, you know, the first thing is education. You have 
to want to learn. It does not necessarily have to be formal or anything like that because I have no degree in writing. I'm an, I'm, I did accounting, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but that's just something that I enjoy doing, mm -hmm. you know? And it, it became easy, like I said, because I enjoy writing. Mm -hmm. And um, returning to Trinidad, I, um, I wanted to be a part of it. And that was my, my door, my window into, you know, the exposure, uh, you know, although I'm sort of a, a backstage kind of person, you know, and did not anticipate in no way that Pan by Storm was going to be a classic some 30 yeah. years, some 30 years later, right. I um, just decided I'll just keep writing. Okay. I'll just keep writing. All right. And I know that you would have spoken about being in that space of the Calypso Review 10. So tell us a little bit about what that activity, what that experience was like being in that space. Oh, fantastic. Something I will never, ever, ever forget, especially being with the Grand Master himself. We developed a relationship, you know, up until his passing, where I would go to the tent nightly, or they, at that time they had, um, they had various clashes and stuff, and I was just exposed to all these Calypsonians and backup singers and you know, the whole Calypso thing. And I was so amazed. I was so, you know, that I was a part of it, not singing, but backstage with, with um, the merchant. I admired him, I admired him. You know, um, there was also Black Stalin. There was Kronta, there was crazy. There was this comedian that I, I had to leave backstage and come, come forward to see Rex, Rex West, because <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was just hilarious, mm -hmm. you know, and then they had some serious, they had, there was Johnny Kane, Bali, there was um, Gypsy, then uh, for the different um, tents, I would meet David Rudder, I would meet Arrow, Designer, Shadow, I would meet all these um, other Calypsonians and just totally overwhelmed, blown away. Tell us a little bit about your involvement with the steel pan movement, because writing a storm entitled Pan by Storm and then Pan Ecstasy, it means that you definitely were involved in the steel pan fraternity because you didn't write a song specifically about the Calypso art form. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay, um, in 1989, Fawn Clare played the composition, uh, Len Booksy Sharp's composition of Fire Down Below. And they tied, um, phase two tied with, uh, with Fawn Clare. And um, I remember distinctly the next day on the radio, Len said, or, or maybe it was the interview, he said, you know, he was, he was so glad that other arrangers was doing his music, but you know, he would like for them to do their own. And I think that was the fire that Ken needed to, to, to step out of his comfort zone. And maybe that in his mind, mind, he wanted to do his own thing. But it was funny because when, when Ken approached me, he had this, he had this melody. You know, at the time he used a handheld um, recorder, recorded, yes. And um, I remember coming in from, from work and he said to me, listen, I've got this, I've got this melody and I had to record it because I'm afraid I'll, I'll forget it. So he ran a, a, a two minutes of the, of the melody maybe if so long. And I said, um, wow, that sounds like Bad by Storm. And I, I just left it like that. He said, wow, okay, I'm, I have to go because, you know, I have to get to, he was with the uh, arranging for Pan Sonatas right. here in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, he left and the next day or the, that later that night, I said, guess what? 
I wrote a verse and chorus for Pan by Storm. Right. And he heard it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, I recall him saying, um, well, let's go with it. I'll show, I'll ask George Victory deceased yeah. if, you know, he thinks she, you should continue or, you know, maybe he should get it. And I felt maybe even Mr. D um, Devines, Devines right. Right. should get it because I'm a nobody, you know, <laughs> but George Victory said to him, listen, she, this is great. She's doing fine. So just let her continue. And I just continued. I just continued. It, it just flowed. It just, you know, there was no thought process behind writing a song. And, you know, it was that day, that night, okay. and right after. Right. Yeah. And it definitely showed your love for um, your culture, in particular, the steel pan as an instrument Love. because you know to write a song that really encapsules you know um uh, just the, the feel and the fervor of um what pan sounds like like a storm coming down it really 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 um you know it's a fantastic ode to to the instrument okay jenny so tell us a little bit about this connection between yourself ken professor fillmore who you said came up with the melody and the decision to choose someone to sing Pan by Storm. What was that whole experience like? Okay, so because we had such a short window before Ken left New York to go home to do his arrangement for the band of Van Clare, it was it was quite trying to get someone to sing. So I said, why don't we call Keith? Okay, and um, ask him if he would do the song, mm -hmm. and so we did. Okay, we did. And by by Keith, you, you mean who exactly? That's Keith Designer Prescott at the time. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we did call him, and he obliged. Okay. And um, we got together, and I said, you know, well, it's a joke we have with each other, where I said, you know, you were the Michael Jackson of this of singing, <laughs> but this is a Pan song, you have to, you know, you want me to cook some fish broth or something to, you know, but um, he obliged, like I said, and he did a fant fantastic job. It's, it's, it's in the, it's in the cards, right. you know, right. yeah, he did a fantastic job. So we did reach out to um, designer and he did it. And we didn't, we never even contemplated another person. Right. We just went to um, designer and stuck with him right through Both and you know that, that that story is an interesting story because this is the kind of information that our audience that young people that people in Trinidad and Tobago would want to know because you know one of the reasons why this project is so important is that when I go to the schools to speak to the secondary school students or I go to the analysis libraries to engage with the general public what they talk about or what they tell me is that once they don't hear a song on the radio or they don't see a performer who would have sung a song of yesteryear what they think is that the person has either died the person is no longer performing or they have actually no recollection of who the person is and part of the necessity of this project is to bring these songs these calypsonians these performers back into the consciousness of trinidad and tobago with these interviews so that now people can see yes these people exist it's only that they migrated. And that is part of the reason why it is you're not seeing them all the time or you're not hearing from them all the time. And so that is part of the importance of this project. So tell us now, Jenny, a little bit about Pan Ecstasy. You have written a Pan song, it's a huge success, and then you launch into this again. So tell us a little bit about that experience. Okay, because of the outcome at the Panorama um, Finals, uh, you know, the band came um, second that year, but uh, it's still the people's choice, you know, that they were the winner for that. So I figured just the ecstasy of it all, you know, um, it's the, from the frenzy of, you know, overwhelming frenzy, frenzy from the crowd and the, the whole train. I was coming into the airport and, and people were like, oh my God, you guys ran away with it. You, the semifinals, you were out 14 points. There's no way, 
you know, so the next year I took that into consideration into um, panic, panics to see, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And tell so, me, what was that experience like in terms of, were you approached to write another song because of the success of Fan by Storm or did, it, did you take it upon yourself? Tell us a little bit about that experience. A little bit of both, you know, um, Ken did say, do you want to do um, another song or, you know, and I said, sure, you know, and, and same reason with the frenzy and all that. I said, you know, let's just, I'm going with pan ecstasy, mm -hmm. you know, and that was it, Megan, <laughs> that was it, that was it. And what we noticed is that, who is the singer? Tell us who is the singer for pan ecstasy. <laughs> it is. Keep designer Prescott. So tell us, how did you all make this decision to go back with the same vocalist or Calypsonian for another song about the Steve Van music? He was phenomenal in the first um, round. So why, you know, we know of something sure, you know, and he himself, um, Keith, uh, designer, he was open and up to it. I mean, he came back not bad, but he was, he was, he re-entered the Calypso Ram because he sang, I think it was um, like the Young Kings, um, the competitions there. So he participated in some of those um, Calypso shows and uh, competitions for Pan, with Pan by Storm. And maybe he felt, you know, he felt just as good as we did. So <laughs> there was no, no way he said no or, you know, it was, it didn't make it the first time I'm done. Or he just said, let's go with it again. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. All right. And so part of what this project is all about, Jenny, is this discussion about migration in terms of persons who are steeped, um, like yourself, in Trinidad and Tobago culture, but to make a decision to migrate. So tell us a little bit about that experience and what would have led you uh, to migrate even though, you know, you said that you would come back or you were writing, you know, you said you spoke to um, students at, at, at Green Machine and as it's, you know, called affectionately. Tell us a little bit about this migration experience and how that would have had an impact on you and your culture. Um, Megan, I left home young, and, you know, and the steel band fraternity here was limited, very much so. And so as it developed, I was a part of that, um, that project, I would say, where we had very small bands. I remember it was, there was Moods, Pan Groove, Sonatas, and very small, you know, six or seven, not many, but these were all members of steel bands that they, they left from Trinidad and came here and decided to continue, you know, and which I think it's just, it's part of my, the lyrics in my, in, in the song, you know, taking pan all over the world. And yes, they, if, if it was not a vision for them, it was definitely a vision for Ken. And then I saw where that was going, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, I worked at NYU and I, I stayed there until, they and uh, NYU has a, a, a steel steel orchestra now, you know, with Professor Haas. And um, well, I was there for from the first performance that they did at the university. <laughs> <laughs> Once I heard, I was what I've yeah. got to be in there. So I just went for support and stuff like that, and spoke with Professor Haas, and um, wanted to know um, where where and how this came about but you know he just said it's 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 an instrument and i was blown away by the students who took part in 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 this in this um orchestra you know and i kept saying why don't i learn to play the pan <laughs> and that was a shock for me because i tried but <laughs> i only tried with Ken Professor's tenor pan, and right. that was his professional instrument. And right. someone who's learning shouldn't be playing on. on right, <laughs> right, yeah. So 
I just kind of stayed away from that and, and kept in the writing um, right. lane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh. when I left, when I left home, nothing, nothing. I, I mean, I mean, nothing. Like I, I said, um, Panam North Stars right. was half a block from my grandmother's house on Bombay Street where I right. live. Mm -hmm. Right. But um, other than that, Megan, in, in the early days, nothing. It was just right here. And I always say, give credit where credit is due. If it wasn't for Ken Professor Fillmore, mm -hmm. I would not have been involved in my culture this deeply. Right. Or maybe, but I know he was definitely yeah. the stalwart for, as far as that is concerned. Okay. So you know? tell, us, tell us now that you've had that experience and you live currently in New York, as you said, you migrated. Have you continued to be part of the um, Caribbean cultural scene or the Trinidad and Tobago cultural scene in New York? Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so um, I'm, I've always been a background person, okay. but yes, I, I, will, I would have um, volunteered for anything, you know, with the Wyattica, um, um, organization, I would volunteer, I would help, I would assist, I would never miss a panorama ever. You know, I would, um, I worked in like the green room right. at, at the back of the Brooklyn Museum with for the, for the shows, the cultural shows. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking um, before um, answering some of these questions, I thought about some of the things that I did and my one of my friends said, "Don't you remember you were involved in the first Caribbean Music Awards at the Showtime at at, at the Apollo?" Wow. wow! Yes, and yeah. the thing is, Megan, I that came up recently. Um, I was talking to someone about about this project, and they said, "But how could you forget that?" And I'm like, "It's not that." I remember getting credit for writing something in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> that was with um he's deceased now that was um chuck sutton mm -hmm. from um wlib wbls mm -hmm. at the time and um the producer of showtime at the apollo mm -hmm. and i i wrote something there and i did stuff stuff with the schools the, the you know just the, the kids just yes yes yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah i remember i was in trinidad and i was um at a show with um and and seated there was mark loquan and right. i said i said to him you know i i, I penned this and he looked at it and he says why don't you show ray Hallman? because yeah. that's something yeah. he's more into um you know a, a more mellow you know, type of song and, right. and stuff like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Ray, Ray, I met Ray, and and then Len Bugsy asked me if we could do something. Right. You know, mm -hmm. but my problem it really is like you say, living out here and they there. Right. You know? so right. It's a, it was a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. You know. But you know, Jenny, that is an interesting story that you just shared with us because what it says is that um, you there is really this trans quotation as it were of the culture even though you live in new york when you would come to trinidad and you shared information about the fact listen i wrote this you know then we see that it just mushrooms and it grows into persons other persons considering the work that you've done persons becoming involved and that is really what we want to do with this project to share information to inform people to educate and to engage people regarding the culture of Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso and steel band music in particular. So, you know, it's really important that you said that you went back to Trinidad. So even though you live in New York, you went back to Trinidad and you still got involved in the culture there. But even when you are in New York, you actually are able to share and participate in cultural activities. And that is really so important for young people to know and for our audience to know that it is not that when you migrate, you forget. Because, you know, the Lord um, Nelson has this song called Foreigner. And, you know, in that song really encapsulates how the, the performer or the Calypsonian or the individual who lived in Trinidad and migrated um, is treated by, um, you know, Trinidadians and Tobagonians when they return as though they are foreigner. And what you just explained is certainly not like that. 
because you know people welcomed you and they said okay you know let's work with you when you talk about land mystery shop so that's really an important um story to share with the audience what i want to get to now is the whole issue of songwriting because as i said earlier many young women and young uh, young boys as well ask me when i go to the schools about how miss how to get into this songwriting this calypso songwriting and i wondered if you could share any sort of um tips any any sort of you know um any instructions that you could give them about how to really get involved in it i mean you said that you you studied accounting so it's interesting <laughs> that you were trained formally as a songwriter but i mean you know that's what it's all about if you have a talent you have a talent so tell me a little bit about that what sort of tips and suggestions do you have for persons wanting to write Calypso? The sky is the limit. You want to write? Like uh, there's a that show that says, if you want to sing, just sing. You want to write? Write, because you never know. You know, uh, I've, I've, in my research, there are writers that did popular songs that big on, on, on the market and no one knew who the writer, who wrote the lyrics to these songs. I mean, Stevie Wonder talks about that. There, there are other people, you know, um, I even spoke to Alvin Daniels, right? you know, and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. He says, what, why you never, why don't you just keep writing? Yeah. And I'm like, it's not like that. You, I just think it's something you have to love and want to do. Right. You have to love it and you want to do it. And don't let anyone stand in your way. Write, even if it's to keep as a, a, a book of, of, of words, you never know when someone and or if someone can put music to your words. And that's exactly what happened, happened with me. You know, um, formal education, I, that's key in any, any aspect of, of life, any aspect. But certain things, you're gifted, it's God's gift. And I really think if you hold on to that, anything that you want to do, you, you put your mind to it, you're going to do it. You can do it. Um, I am living proof of that. <laughs> Thank you I, for that. Yes. Um, I want to touch on another issue. You are a woman in yes. this fraternity. And you know, there is, you know, we understand that the Calypso is a male dominated art form. Of course, we know that there are more women involved now. We know about Calypso Rose and we call her um, Lady Irie, and we know about singing Francine, and we know about, you know, saying deceased singing Sandra, and so many of the others coming down to Rina Shea, et cetera. But I want you to talk now a little bit about your experience as a female, as a woman in the fraternity even as a songwriter, even being in the space when you spoke about the experience at the Calypso Review. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, I'll go back to one of my faves again, and that's um, The Merchant. Uh, mm -hmm. At the back of the review, the backstage, there was a downstairs where the Calypsonians would be together before the, it's time for their parents on stage. And I admired how he would sit there and write. Ah. <laughs> mm -hmm. He was writing. Another person that did that and I just admired was The Shadow. I never knew he, he wrote or penned his lyrics. So I saw him sitting in a dressing room. Right. Writing, just writing. Mm -hmm. And then singing what he wrote. Mm -hmm. So I looked at these men, really, Megan? I there weren't any females that I could have looked at there and being living here, right. the only people that I could connect with that is like my Angelo or right. you know, something right. not right. in my, right. within my culture. Right. So right. I, it was re, it really was male dominated. Right. You know, right. but I view them as people who just, they just said, I can do that. Okay. You know? If he's just sitting there and say, okay, I'm going to write this and watch. I'm right. going to sing it when I go upstairs and right. sing it. And it was well received. Right. So, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So that is a great tip there because I think, you know, oftentimes um, the experience of the female or the experience of the woman in Calypso is so different. Um, and, you know, you are not a, a front stage uh, performer. 
but instead you are a songwriter. Um, and in this particular case, your experience will be so different, of course, to the background singer, to the producer, to the arranger. So it's important that you share with us, Jenny. Is there anything that you'd like to share with us about your experience? Um, perhaps even when you um, would have been writing or when you were in, in different spaces dealing with Calypsonians or, um, you know, just receiving a claim for your writing. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, once it was known that I written Pan by Storm, right. everything just went, you know, or it just the, the, it came to light. It came to light that I I, I wrote Pan by Storm, and um, there are lots of people. I, I I don't know everyone's name, but a lot of people approached me regarding that. Wow, we never knew. You, you know, I, we never knew you wrote Pan by Storm. As a matter of fact, I don't know if it's okay to call names, but, but we can, you know. Yes, yes. I was at, I was at the, um, the funeral of um, the late Ken Professor Fillmore, mm -hmm. and someone saw me there, and they said, how are you connected with, you know, Wow, wow, that is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, how are you? And I said to the person, I said, you know, I wrote Pan by Storm and, and Pan Ecstasy. Yeah. And they were like, no way. We lived in New York together. He went back, he moved back to Trinidad mm -hmm. to live. And that was Deward Phillip. Right. Yeah. And he said, I, you never said anything. And I said, no, I never said anything. <laughs> <laughs> I never said anything, but mm -hmm. him, and like I said, you know, quite, quite a few. And I think that's where I got the opportunity to write the, um, it wasn't this, it was the, the, the opening um, for um, the first Caribbean Music Awards at the Apollo, Right. you know? Right. Yes, I got the opportunity to write something for them. And um, I wrote, I wrote, um, I wrote a poem recently when we had no no carnival, no right. panorama. Right. No, yes, I wrote a poem, and that that too, I just with the feeling, I expressed that on paper, and it was so well received that um, there was a, a a journalist from the um, Trinidad Guardian who was listening to the. Um, Duvon Stewart's platform, um, right. the Facebook platform, mm -hmm. and he called to to you know use excerpts from that poem mm -hmm. to write his article. Right. Um, I think his name was Gibbons, Mr. Gibbons. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I have a book with songs, but okay. I don't know who to give it to. Oh, so you are um, you did not only write two songs. These are the published, these, this is published. <laughs> so you are indeed, I, you are indeed a songwriter then. You are indeed, you have well, a book of songs that you I, have. I, I can be returning from Trinidad mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, after carnival or something. And while I'm on the, the, the plane, right. I will just take out my little book oh, because something yeah. is stirring in my head, you know? Yeah. So you see, these are the little techniques. <laughs> yes, <laughs> those yes. young women and those young men who I go to Listen, secondary then, school, they would want to know how because they not, they don't only just want to know how to write a calypso. You know, they want to know what is the process. What do they have to do? What do they have to look at? Where do they have to be? And this is it. They need to just be aware. You know, get involved in the culture, be a part of it, and you know, the material will come. The material will come, and once it's it cooked, will. It's you it exactly, will. it's a part of who you are. Mm -hmm. It will, yes, right. absolutely, absolutely. Jenny, do you have any any points that you want to reflect on regarding, um, you know, the state of Calypso, where you see Calypso going, having written for it and having seen your song, you know, become so prolific in terms of being played on a steel fan? Where do you see Calypso going as we move hopefully past this pandemic. <laughs> yes, and I'm, I'm an optimist. So I am hoping that this is a new beginning because like I said again, in the lyrics, 
we, I said that the um, steel band and Calypso were suppressed, but there's a, a whole new generation also that has come to the realization that this is something great. This is something great. And um, within the past year, I met some young musicians at all, and I'll name um, Andre White, mm -hmm. um, Duvon Stewart, um, Earl Brooks Jr. I've met them all and I love where they're going yeah. as far as the steel band is concerned, as the steel pan is concerned. It, although some of them have bands, orchestras, right. but as soloists, so, you know, mm -hmm. I love where they go and I love, like what they see in, and, and it's not like, you know, you used to hear words like, oh my God, they're making so much noise right. and stuff like that. No, it's music, mm -hmm. it's music. So I am hoping, like I said, and that's the vision, right. that it's gone all over the world, which I'm telling you, I've gotten calls from Japan when people found out I, you know, right. all, all, you know, to say, yeah. wow. Yeah. So, because so now it's all over the world and it's going further. I, I. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations on your continuing success. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> of the thank you. Thank of these thank two you. fantastic songs um, about our steel band music. So Jenny, I just want to thank you very much for this wonderful interview and for taking the time to share with us your reflections on your experience as a songwriter your experience about um the calypso fraternity and what that was like and all about your you know your your prescriptions for um the art form and for the culture of Trinidad and Tobago beyond so thank you very much and I you're quite you welcome <laughs> you're quite welcome because uh, like this it has opened up a whole new world for me Okay. You know, even being on stage with or backstage with um, Cicely Tyson was there. So many Caribbean folks that was involved in, and not not to this level. Right. You know, so it's really a pleasure. Thank you for having me, thinking of me. Yeah. Thanks again. Okay. Take care.